Well, thanks everyone for coming out today to our ECOM seminar. I uh, appreciate everyone that is here. I know what everything is happening. So most, pre most people probably is, are watching it online. And I appreciate Paul Simon for coming today. And I just, I'm pretty sure most of you know Paul. So I just will mention a few words. Uh, Paul got his PhD in 1991 in chemistry in Penn State. Then he transitioned into a postdoc in 1991 to 1996 at the University of Minnesota, working with Peter McMurray. And after that, he was a professor at the Department of Environmental Sciences and Air Pollution Research Center at the University of California, Riverside. Then seven years ago, he came to CU Boulder and since then, he has been working at chemistry, in the chemistry department, and Ceres. And I met him like seven years ago. I was kind of ready to graduate then. But then uh, something, so he's working there now. And I just, I will mention this. So in 2001, Paul received the Whitby Award from the American Association for Aerosol Research. I had to Google it, but it's a very recognized outstanding for outstanding te technical contributions to aerosol science and technology. Um, well, with that, thanks, Paul, for coming. Okay. Okay, well, thanks, Yvonne. So everyone can hear me, I take it? Okay, good. All right, so um, thanks for the invitation, and it's nice to be, to be back here again and, and talk to all the people I know. So. Um, I'm going to talk today about something a little different um, than, than what I normally talk about. And so this is a, a project on indoor air chemistry that <clears throat> we've been working on sort of collaboratively for about the last six or seven years. And so this is an interesting program. And as you can see up there, it's funded by the Sloan Foundation. And so it's a private foundation. And, and, and the way it works is that program managers go around and they try to find areas of research that they feel is underfunded by the federal government <clears throat> and try to develop long-term programs that might last 10 years or so at quite high levels of funding on the order of five million a year. And so then they go out and find people to do the research. And in this case, this started with some preliminary work in 2013 and then a full-blown program in 2015. And it probably is probably maybe 20 different groups or so <clears throat> working on this now. And so, <clears throat> um, I've been working on this since then with a number of collaborators who you know, Jose Amanez, Yos Legao, and Shelley Miller at CU. And then the work I'm going to talk about today was done by a, a number of people, a postdoc, Shang Lu, um, and then former, or former or current graduate students of mine, Dimitrios Pagonis, Luke Algram, Zach Feinwax, and Ben Deming. And so what I'm going to talk about today is <clears throat> probably mostly going to be three field studies. Um, one that we've, all things that we've done on the CU Boulder campus. So the idea of this has been to sort of bring um, the instrumentation and the knowledge of atmospheric chemists indoors, which is an environment that's heavily understudied. And so, um, so that's what we've been doing. And, um, and so I'm going to talk about some things we've done on campus, which involves a study in a classroom. Um, the CU Boulder Art Museum, and then also an athletic center. And if I have time, but I think since we're running late, I'll probably skip some things I was going to talk about, about some laboratory studies on, on paint, since I think this would go over. OK, so these are the people that have worked on it. I didn't have a picture of Sean, but this is, was from Dimitros' wedding a couple years ago. So Luke, Dimitros, Zach, and Ben over there. OK. <clears throat> so. Some of the interest in indoor air chemistry has to do with the fact that, that on average, we spend about 90% of our time indoors. As you can see here, of all the pieces of that pie, there's one outdoor section at about 8%. And the rest is mostly indoors and then in, in vehicles. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of sort of air quality indoors, um, the, the Figure on the right-hand side uh, comes from a paper we recently published, uh, mostly involving some work that Jose uh, did to put this together on a sort of a carbon balance type um, investigation for comparing indoor environments with outdoor areas. And sort of the thing to note here is that this is, so these are concentrations. And so this includes VOCs of different sort of oxidation state measured with different sort of SIMS instruments or PTRMS 
and then some aerosol component. And if you look, these are all the indoor measurements that we've made. And actually, this one is from some, a group in Berkeley, but this is our museum and our classroom. And you can sort of see that it's, these are sort of on the, air, on the order of what you'd find in a, in a megacity. So, so indoor air can, can have enormous concentrations of, of VOCs and other organics compared to, to outdoors. Um, and then there's another issue here, which is that, as you're, I'm sure you're all aware from this paper from Brian McDonald in Science a few years ago showing that, that um, these consumer products, sort of um, volatile chemical products, can, can be an important component of atmospheric <coughs> VOCs. And even though sort of in this pie there's sort of a small piece of what's actually used because of the high um, emission factors that they have, they can actually contribute, as you can see here, a large fraction of VOCs. And this is for the LA area. And then also contribute a substantial amount of secondary organic aerosol as a result of processing. And so, so the, the indoor air environment's interesting, not only from the perspective of the impact on people living there, but also from its potential as a source of VOCs to the ambient atmosphere. And so for the work that we do, it's a very process-oriented, much like one does for atmospheric chemistry. And so we're interested in, in various sources, and so things we're familiar with, VOCs emitted from, from anthropogenic and biogenic sources, ozone and NOx, which can all be transported indoors. And then VO, the emissions that occur indoors, including just human activities, emissions from humans, uh, chemistry that happens on people, as well as on various surfaces, and then all the emissions from it, the various materials that we use, um, either from sort of furniture and carpets and whatnot, but then also um, the various products that we use indoors. And then once those are transported indoors, we're interested in, in what are the, the sinks for those, including chemical reactions, um, partitioning to indoor surfaces, and then also ventilation to outdoors. And so we're, we, our, our focus is always to try to understand all aspects. Where, do the, where are chemicals coming from, and then where are they going? And so the first <coughs> study I'll talk about is one we did in, in 2014, and this was the, the one that Chang Lu headed up. And so this was, was a study in a, in a classroom in the chemistry building on campus. So this is a sort of stadium-style style classroom, holds about 200 students. Um, <clears throat> you can sort of see some statistics there. The most important ones tend to be the air exchange rate. So this is one of the things that tends to limit the sort of uh, oxidation kinds of uh, VOC oxidation indoors is because the resonance times tend to be quite short, and so the chemistry has to be really fast. There's also not much light indoors, and so making OH, for instance, is not very significant. And so much of the oxidation happens with ozone that's tran transported indoors from outdoors. Another thing that you'll see here is that there's, the, they turn off the ventilation almost entirely, not completely, but almost entirely at night. And so we can take advantage of that. And then as far as cleaning goes, they only use water. And so we don't have any cleaning products that are being emitted in the classroom. So for this study, <clears throat> this was the first one we had done. And so we had a quadrupole PTRMS. We had an acetate SIMS to measure um, acids, and then we had some other measurements on CO2, ozone, NOx, and humidity. And so to show you some results, so what we did was to use the, analyze the PTRMS data using positive matrix factorization to try to, to do a sort of a source apportionment for the VOCs. And so that's what's shown here. And so we, from this analysis, we were able to, to identify three factors. The one is this, what we call a human influence factor. This one is ventilation. And this one is sort of background emissions or chemistry that can happen on surfaces. And what you can see from these numbers for the, over the whole period of this study, it's roughly a third, a third, a third. Right? So all of these matter as far as, as determining the VOC composition indoors. And then if we look at these <coughs> sort of the the time profiles, say over the course of a day, we can see that, that these are, as one might expect, for the, the, the human activity, it's during the course of the day when the students are present, when that's at the highest concentrations. 
The <coughs> um, ventilation factor is, is sort of relatively flat across here. And then the, the chem, sort of chemistry or emissions fact, indoor emissions factor is high, highest at night and then lowest during the day. And so the way these factors are determined is after the sort of mass spectrum is, is, um, is extracted from the analysis, then these are, we look for correlations with different uh, other measurements to be able to figure out what these are determined by. And so that's why, in this case, all of these data, looking at concentrations of those, correlate well with CO2, and CO2 indoors is primarily determined by, by humans. And then the, the correlation here with relative humidity is due to the fact that the relative humidity is primarily controlled by how much circulation there is between indoors and outdoors. Right? And so the way the system works is, there's, is, is the circulation sometimes will draw in some air from outdoors, but it'll also just remix air that's already in there. And so there's some combination of indoor-outdoor air mixing at every stage, <coughs> and that is dependent on the temperature and things like that. But anyway, this allows us to to see what the, what's due to ventilation. And then in this case, for the sort of reactivity, what we see is, is really an anti-correlation with ozone. So when ozone is low, this is when, the, when reactions have been happening, of course, uh, during the course of the night here. And I'll show you some more data on that. All right. Sorry, um, that, that yes. Same plot there, it, they really don't line up. So you go from the start from zero. I'm sorry, down here? Well, yeah, so go to, first you go to zero, the value that you have at zero, and then go up and look at, and then, okay, I'll go over to 24, and look at how much more it, Oh, down here. Yeah, so there's not, they don't, they don't match up. So, I mean, there could be some differences between, you know, what, what it looked like at this, yeah. at this point, okay. and, then, and the follow, 24 hours later, right, I think is probably what's okay. going on there, yeah. So it's not perfectly wrapping around, yeah. So looking then a little more at the chemistry, so this is chemistry essentially that can, can occur on skin surfaces, and this has been pretty well known for oh, a decade or so. And essentially this involves ozonolysis. And so you know, we have skin lipids that are various unsaturated compounds. Squalene is, a, is sort of the most abundant, which is a C30 um, alkene with six double bonds in it. And so highly reactive with ozone, and so the sort of typical reaction is to add to the double bond, make this ozonide, which will decompose, then you get a pair of either a Kriege intermediate or a carbonyl, and depending on where it breaks, you get you know, one or the other of these. And so in our data from the classroom, we can see evidence for this sort of chemistry. So, so this is sort of a busy slide, but if, if you look here first, the, at the purple line, so, and then these, these uh, yellow areas are where, the, where there was a class break. So the students in here, and we can see various chemicals present, the various VOCs. When they, there is a class break, the ozone goes up, right, because it's not being reacted away, and then the concentrations of these components go down. And then we see the same thing at this other break period, and then there's, once the classes are end for the day, we can see these decays, and we can sort of uh, identify these as first generation or second generation products. So for instance, at the end here, you see the first generation products go down much faster than the second generation ones do because there's still some first generation products around for them to react with. All right. So in addition to the PTRMS measurements, we also had this acetate SIMS, which is predominantly measuring carboxylic acids, and so this occurs by the, you have acetic anhydride is added to the source, and then with a, you have a radioactive source that ionizes that, and we get acetate ions, and those will proton transfer with, with acids to then give us a charred species that we can measure. And so one of the things we did, as you'll sort of see down here, is we ended up with about 155 peaks <coughs> that we identified. And this was with a high resolution mass spec, so we could get um, elemental ratios so we developed a calibration curve that we could use over all of these different compounds. And so this was simply running a whole series of standards with different oxygen to carbon and hydrogen to carbon ratios, and then comparing that sensitivity with, um, this is comparing the sensitivity that's calculated from this curve then for the various species with what was actually measured. And so you can see we're sort of within a factor of two 
over all the different classes of compounds that we looked with. So a fairly uh, nice way to calibrate for such a complex set of products. And then the other thing that was done is <coughs> using these, the elemental composition, we could go back and try to assign chemical uh, structures to these, at least what functional groups were present. Knowing that they're, so the assumption here is that they're all carboxylic acids, and then we can look at <coughs> double bond equivalents and the amount of oxygen in there to assign either mono, monosaturated acids, monounsaturated, diacids, or hydroxycarbonyl acids, and then on and on down from here. And so that's the, the idea of the, of the analysis. And so these are some results. <coughs> so looking first at this table, this is showing indoor air, and then we also made a few days of outdoor air measurements. We couldn't do this at the same time because we were located too far away from the outdoors to be able to sort of just switch back and forth. So we had to actually move the instrument. So what you can see here is that <coughs> there's primarily two types of acids that are present. So monocarboxylic acids and hydroxycarboxylic acids. And interestingly, the, the actual proportions indoors and outdoors are, are pretty similar. And, and then what you'll see is that the, the ratios, it's about seven times higher concentrations indoors than outdoors. And, and if you look back to the previous, a previous slide, I said there was about 100 ppb of VOCs total in the classroom. And here we're measuring <coughs> numbers on the order of seven ppb. So about 7% of the VOCs were these carboxylic acids. Now let's point out these two, this is essentially formic acid and this is lactic acid. And the lactic acid is just you know, um, emitted in perspiration. Right? And so it's really the dominant acid that one finds indoors. We can also look at <coughs> correlations between these and human activity, which is this, uh, using CO2 as the marker for that. And so these are now plots for three components out of 11 that correlated with, with CO2. And the first of these is, is lactic acid. And if you look at the scales here, this is different by a factor of 1,000. So these are PPB values. And the others here are PPT, all right? And so again, we're sort of in this five to five or so PPB range for lactic acid. We can also look at <coughs> what potential role surface chemistry has. And so what's shown here, um, this is, this is a, a plot taken at night. So this is from 1 a.m. till 6 a.m. when the ventilation is for the most part turned off. And so, here, this, is, this sort of enhancement rate is essentially just a, a first order rate at which the, the, the composition of these various acids is, is changing. And so you can see that, so the idea here is that the, this rate is, is decreasing over the course of the night due to the fact that the ozone concentrations are going down and they're not being, so they're not being replenished. And so as, when there's less ozone around, there's less reaction occurring on surfaces, and so as a result of that, we have less acid formation. So we <clears throat> followed up on this a few, few years later. So I had a student who um, developed a method to measure concentrations of carbon-carbon double bonds in um, or films that are found on surfaces. And so he went around and collected various films, and I'll show you some of that data in a second. But in this particular study, we, he made some measurements in this classroom, both at night or right before they turned off the ventilation and then again after they turned it back on in the morning. And so what you see is once it's turned off, the ozone concentration drops down, and then there's this, slow, this small sort of steady state value that's due to the fact that there's still some, some coming in with, with the small amount, the reduced amount of ventilation that's there. <clears throat> and we can use this data and do some fitting and, and calculations to determine that about 650 micromoles of ozone is lost to the surfaces in this classroom overnight. And then we can extract the deposition velocity, which is about 0.02 centimeters per second. It's very similar to what people have measured in lots of other indoor studies. But then in addition to that, <coughs> we had these, these alkene data. And what he saw was, so these are, this is just the walls 
These are vertical desks, so these are, well, you don't have them here, but you know how you can have desks in either in a vertical position or horizontal. And so these were ones that were left vertical overnight. These were horizontal, and then this is the floor. And so what you, <coughs> you can see here is that there's a clear decrease overnight of alkenes for things that are in the vertical position. There's an increase here at night for things that are horizontal, which we attribute simply to deposition of particles that have alkenes in them. And so we can't, we can't say much about how much these are reacting with ozone during the night, but clearly these surfaces are. And so if we, if we just look at these surfaces, this will, the, the decay we see here accounts for roughly 10% or so of the ozone that we see disappear at night. But if we assume that the, the we just scale according to the surface area of these as well, which seems a reasonable assumption, um, we can account for more or less all of the ozone that's depleted overnight. So it's, it's, it appears to be mostly being lost simply to, to reactions of, of alkenes that have deposited on surfaces, probably skin flakes and sorts of things like that from, from the kids that are in there during the day. And then <clears throat> this student also made some measurements uh, in different locations on campus. So this was in an office, in the dining hall, bowling alley, classroom, museum, and in, in the gym. And he measured both the mass of aerosol in some in film, surface films that he had collected as well as carbon-carbon bond concentrate, carbon-carbon double bond concentrations, and then this is just the ratio of those two. And for the most part, what you see, there's certain ver certainly variability, but there's, you know, it's, it's not an enormous change, factors of two or three maybe in most cases. And, and we can just sort of look at average properties, and so, Across all of these environments, what one has is, is on average about a four nanometer fil thick film of organic material that contains about 20% alkenes, and just assuming sort of some average molecular weight for material. And <clears throat> if we use the deposition velocity that we measured in sort of typical ozone concentration in a, in a room during daytime, um, it suggests that the alkene lifetime is on the order of an hour. So it means these films are actually highly dynamic because they must be replaced that quickly again. Okay. All right, so the next study I want to talk about <coughs> is the one we did in the, in the art museum. And so this was done more recently, so this was 2017. And we targeted this for a period when we could overlap with the Bachelor of Fine Arts exhibits that go on so that we could look at effects of a lot of people coming and going. And so for this, <coughs> we, we again used PTRMS measurements. We also had an iodide SIMS, some nitrate SIMS measurements, and then these other various gases and whatnot. And so the way that the, the um, museum operates in terms of circulation, so we were measuring from a gallery, and then sort of we've mapped out the rest of the museum, and here's the supplier. So you can see that the air exchange within the gallery is pretty rapid, about 10 times per hour. And then for the overall museum, we're, it's roughly one exchange per hour. Um, and then we're, in here, we were interested in all these various factors, emissions, deposition, as well as reactions. And this just gives you a sense. So the museum temperature and humidity are very tightly controlled. And so that was, could, was actually somewhat of a disadvantage. We would have liked to have been able to manipulate that a little, but we, we weren't able to. And, and I should point out, so that in, in this study, we were able to sample both inside the gallery and also from supply air, so we could compare differences. And so when the, when the room is higher than the supply air, then it means that there's emissions indoors. And so we could measure, using that and some modeling, we could extract emissions ra emission rates for various chemical components. We couldn't do that in the previous study because we were too far away to be able to measure the the incoming air. So <clears throat> this is what it, it looked like in the gallery that we were measuring. So we had a hole drilled in the wall over here, and then up here we could sample the air. This is where the air comes in, and so this was the supply air, and this is the room air that we're sampling. And then all our instrumentations were in the corridor in the back behind here. And so, <clears throat> so what's shown here first is a plot of, of CO2, and this was done during um, this, this Bachelor of Fine Arts exhibit when maybe 200, 300 people came in between about 5 and 7 p.m. And so you can see this large pulse in CO2, 
as in the gallery, and then this is in the supply air, so it's being diluted as, with, with ambient air as it, as it circulates through. And then <clears throat> if we look here, this is now just a, the overall CO2 emission rate that we can extract from our modeling of this data. And you, you can see the most interesting thing here is maybe how much detail one can actually extract. So this little notch in the data here, in fact, has to do with the fact that <clears throat> at about this time, we can see this drop in the CO2 in the gallery and an increase in the rest of the building, which is just indicating that for some reason, a bunch of people moved from the gallery into the, into the rest of the building. And so the CO2 concentrations have changed as a result of that. Okay. And then with regards to VOCs, this is a time profile for acetone. And so again, you can see it's in, um, it's in excess of the supply air, so it's being emitted within the, within the gallery. And then this is a, an emission rate that we can determine based on, again, these profiles and the modeling that we do. And so <clears throat> we've seen this, we've got these, these for lots of different VOCs, and we've plotted over here then a emission factor in terms of micrograms per person per hour. And we've plotted these against values measured in another study by Alan Goldstein and, and um, Bill Nazaroff's group at, in a Berkeley classroom. And you see a very nice agreement between the, the emission factors. A couple of outliers have to do with monoterpenes and the ethanol. So in our case, the monoterpenes are quite a bit lower than what they measured. And this we, we think has to do with the fact that most of the monoterpenes are coming from personal care products, which are normally applied during the mor in the morning. And so they've been lost over the course of the day relative to their classroom study where they were making morning measurements. And then the ethanol is a little is clearly higher here. And although there was no alcohol served at this event that we were studying, it, one can estimate that it only needed maybe uh, a few people to have gone out and had a drink before they came to the exhibit to see the, the elevation that we saw there. And then a couple of other plots from some other events that we encountered. So this was <clears throat> when uh, there was a, a, a dinner that was hosted, and after that was over, we see this large, <laughs> large increase in methanol, this big spike here, which decays away, which we assume has had to do with some cleaning products that were being used after the event. And then here's another example. This is ethylene glycol. And this was during a painting event, so before every exhibit, you know, when they're going to put up new, new art and whatever, they paint the walls. And so in this case, the ethylene glycol is just coming, one of the VOCs emitted by the paint. All right. And again, we can extract the amounts of, of, that are emitted in each of these from the data and, and the modeling that we did. All right. So in addition to, to measuring emission rates, we were also in, interested in deposition rates to surfaces. And so, again, what's shown here is the same profile I showed before about for CO2 concentrations. And <clears throat> you can sort of see the decay here, which is just due to after, after people have left at this period, then it's just decaying due to it being ventilated to the outdoors. Right? With the regards to lactic acid, which I said before is a major um, emission from humans in perspiration, you see that there's almost no lactic acid in the supply air. So it's, it's effectively being removed either on the walls within the, in the room or within the, within the um, HVAC system as it circulates back. And so we can take these sorts of data and extract deposition rates for the different components. And so that's what's shown here. So these are first order rate constants for deposition to surfaces for a whole distribution of VOCs. And these were things measured both with the PTRMS and then with the iodide sims, which get somewhat more oxidized species. And this is just plotted against the, the <coughs> saturation and vapor concentration calculated using the simple structure activity relationship. And you can see, as you might expect, that the uh, for things that are very volatile, deposition rates are very small, and then as the vapor pressure decreases, the vapor or the deposition rates increase, right? in more or less a linear fashion here. And then, <clears throat> but however, 
We can also plot the data against the Henry's Law constant. So in this building, the humidity, as I said before, was about 45%, pretty constant. And so you can get moisture on the walls. And here you can see the similar sort of thing where the, the, um, <clears throat> the more soluble species tend to have the highest deposition rates. And then those that are, have low water solubilities are not de deposited very fast. So we, we can't exactly tell which is controlling most of the things that we're looking at. But, but and, and unfortunately, this is a case where it would have been nice to be able to vary the humidity in the building to see how things changed. So then we did some modeling of the chemistry to try to, to see um, what we could extract from that. And so this is the, the model that we used. So some NOx chemistry had some, <clears throat> we just grouped all the VOCs. Most of what we were seeing was monoterpenes. So we, we took a sort of a rate constant for, for I think it was limonene with, with ozone, and then for, with what it would be with OH and NO3, and then JNO2, we had some, we, we made light measurements inside. And then we fit um, the, the a deposition velocity to the surfaces, and then also to the occupants that were in the room. And so the model and, and measurements look like this. So ozone varying a little bit over the course of the day. You see the model with the adjusted parameters, it fits well, same for the NO2. And then for NO, it's, the NO is quite a bit more variable. And um, <clears throat> we think that's due to the fact that there's a kiln in the neighboring building where there's a, a, a lot of uh, combustion going on. And so we think NO is coming from there or possibly just um, nearby vehicle emissions. And so we can use that <coughs> to, to um, try to estimate the, the relative contributions of these different loss processes for controlling ozone concentration. So the blue is for just deposition to gallery surfaces. Uh, this one to N reaction with NO, deposition on people, and then reactions with NO2. And you can see over the course of at least this one day period, it, the gallery surfaces are pretty flat, roughly in the 60% range. And then the rest is and very little from NO2, for NO2 reactions. And then a lot of variability um, depending on how much NO is coming from outdoors and how many people are inside. All right? So this is during the event that we were looking at, for instance. And so for, again, from this, we can extract then from these fits that we do values for <coughs> ozone deposition velocities. And so this is for our campaign for the surfaces, and this is on to occupants. And this is what people have seen in the literature. So we get numbers that are fall in the same range as what's been observed before. So it gives us some confidence in, in the modeling that we're doing. So then one of the other things that we did, so one of the students <coughs> during this study just peeled an orange. And oranges, these navel oranges emit mostly limonene into the air. And in this case, it was about a part per billion. And so what's shown here in this black curve is the, <clears throat> the monoterpene concentration, which, as I said, is essentially almost all, all limonene. And then <clears throat> the blue curve is what it should look like if it was just being ventilated based on the, the uh, air circulation rate, air exchange rate. And then this is some modeling that includes some, some other losses from deposition or from chemistry. And so we, this, this provides some evidence that there, there are some reactions going on that are with, with limonene and potential products that were being formed. And so this was a case where we had the nitrate sims running. And so we could measure down here <coughs> these highly oxidized molecules, so-called HOMs. So these are things in the, you know, with carbon to oxygen, or carbon oxygen ratios sort of approaching one or so. And so these are thought to be formed from sort of auto-oxidation proxy radical isomerization reactions that can add oxygen very quickly. And these, the a requirement is that there, there's no uh, significant competing reactions, say, from reactions with HO2 or NO or other RO2 radicals. And so this is then just showing something people have seen in the lab for these kinds of systems, again, that one can <coughs> generate these uh, our data showing sort of for the first time that you can generate these in an indoor environment as well. Right. And so again, we did some modeling of this. And so this is, this is our, our the, the black uh, 
markers are, are the, the measurements that we made. And then the dashed lines, um, there have been some measurements made in the lab of the yields of HOMS from, from limonene oxidation. And, and the, the range is 5%, 17%. So that's what's shown here. And then this is using an average value of that for our model and gets very nice agreement between these two. And then in addition to that, um, we were able to, we could model the, and, uh, the SOA formation that would be, would occur as a result of this. And you see it's not much, right? But the background level is very low, less than a microgram per cubic meter. And then we see this pulse, right, from, uh, from the auto oxidation. And, and I should just point out that from the modeling, we can say that roughly uh, almost 100% of the HOMs are being formed through the ozone chemistry, not with the low levels of OH that are present or the low levels of NO3 radicals that are present. OK, so the other, the, the last field study I'll talk about was one we did um, more recently in 2018. And this was in the Dalward Athletic Center on campus. And so <clears throat> in this case, we went there for a couple, a few weeks. And, and the, in this, so this is the athletic center where, where the student athletes work out. It's not just open to all the, all the students. And so there's, as it says over there, so in, in this case, it was in winter and it was mostly skiing teams, tennis, um, cheerleaders, Ralph, you know, people who handle the, the buffalo and, um, and, and other people. And so there, during this event, there was both regular exercise periods where teams would come in an exercise, and then there were open periods where, where anybody, any of the athletes could come in. And then we measured <coughs> with a, a VOCUS PTR TOF, so this is with Joost de Gau's instrument, um, which has higher resolution than the, than the other measurements we've, we've been making. We also had these other instruments running. We had a GC coupled to the VOCUS, a GCEI TOF, and an iodide SIMS. I'm just going to talk about um, the, the PTR TOF data today, and we also had some particle measurements. And so this is another case where we could alternate sampling between the room and the supply air to get information on um, emission rates inside. And so this is what the setup looked like. So we were up on this balcony with all our instruments, and then down below were all the training facilities. And so <clears throat> as one might expect, if we look at just the time profile of CO2, you see a very good correlation between CO2 and the athletes. And so what's over here is number of athletes. And so in this case, we had, we had um, video of what was going on throughout the, the campaign, what the, what the athletes were doing. And so we could go back and, and count how many were in there at this time. Um, <clears throat> and so then if we look at, at the again, emission rates here over blown up for just this small period, we can see again that they correlate well. But they're not, it's not perfect. You know, sometimes the emission rates are higher for the same number of people. Sometimes it's lower for the same number. And this is due to sort of two issues. One is just who's in there, um, uh, whether it's, it's male or female athletes, and then also just the, the intensity level of the exercising that they're doing. And so the VOC profiles, these are, these are some examples of what we're able to see. So this is, so the, the gray that you see here is when we're switching back and forth between um, outdoor air and, or the supply air and the, and the room air. And then the, in between, we're just interpolating those points. And so the blue is, is the supply air. The red is, is the, the room air. And you can see a number of different profiles here. And so when, the, when people come in at about 6.30 AM, you see a sharp spike in concentrations <coughs> of most of these components. And so you see acetone here, for instance, and, and you can see it tracking this dashed line, which is the, the students. And then as they, when they left, you can see this decay due to the ventilation process going on. And you see a very similar profile for isoprene. And, and both of these are known to be emitted in human breath. And so th this is what one might expect. If we look at some of the other profiles, for instance, <clears throat> this one here, which is for this sulfur-containing compound, you see it's more or less flat over the whole period. And that's something that's, that's being emitted from the basically the rubber material that makes up the flooring. Right? And as that decomposes, it emits this stuff. 
And then <clears throat> if we look down here, so this is D5 siloxane, so this is something that's a component of deodorant, and you see that <clears throat> It goes up very fast and then decays very quickly. And so within sort of half an hour or so of exercise, most of the deodorant that people have applied has already been volatilized. And then these, <coughs> these last two here, these are also thought to be um, these sort of consumer products, but they behave quite a bit differently from that. And we're not exactly sure why. Um, some of this in the case of monoterpenes um, could be, for instance, it has other sources. For instance, maybe if you've, you've had orange juice or something in the morning and you then breathe out um, terpenes as a result of that. The dipropylene glycol, again, is more of a consumer product, but some of it may have to do with, with sort of how fast some of these things will volatilize off of surfaces. And then <clears throat> we can also um, get... It, 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 uh, emission factors for the various um, components. So these are showing for acetone, for isoprene, and then the, for this other organic compound um, versus the CO2. And so it's giving you a sense of how much the VOC emissions correlate with the, the activity, the metabolism. And so these points down here are for people at rest, and then these are for the exercising athletes. And so you see, as you might expect, nice correlations between the CO2 and that. And, and we also have what's designated here. So in, in blue is, the, is males, and this is dominated by females. And you see higher ones on this end, which is, we think is mostly due to the fact that just the men are bigger, right? And so they end up um, metabolizing more. And as a result of that, they end up with higher VOC emissions. And then if you, one looks at down here at <coughs> monoterpenes, you can see those are basically flat. And so that's why we say this would be sort of a personal care product as well as rather than it's not related, clearly not related to metabolism, so it has no correlation with CO2. Right. And then one of the other things <coughs> we did was so there was they periodically come in and clean the equipment. And so this is using a chlorine bleach. And so we see. Here, this is using with iodide sims and the PTRMS that <clears throat> you see this sharp spike when the cleaning event occurs. And this is from, from HOCl, which then decays away. And then there's this slower peaking and decaying of a whole series of organic compounds. So this group here, which has carbons, chlorines, and nitrogen in here. And then these others, which are just carbon, and for the most part, carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen. And so <clears throat> we've assigned these to, as it says down there, chloraldamines and nitriles. And <clears throat> the chemistry of these is actually known from studies in, in wastewater. And so what happens is that amino acids will react with HOCl through a dehydration reaction, form this product, which can then <clears throat> react again with HOCl to add more chlorine to the system. And this can either decompose by losing HCl to make a nitrile, or it can <clears throat> decompose by losing HCl and to make this chloraldamine. And so we see both of these going on. And so apparently what's going on is they come in and they clean the surfaces, right? And the, and the bleach reacts with all the sweat, uh, the amino acids from the sweat that's been deposited, and then leads to the emissions of these various species. And some additional sort of support for this idea is that the, um, if one looks at the relative abundance of different uh, amino acids in skin, you see a reasonable correlation with what we saw in terms of signals. Those that tend to be most abundant in, in sweat are the, the higher signals we see, and then the lower ones are lower signals. And so I think since we started late, and it's already almost um, 3, 4.30, I should probably stop here. I have some other stuff. We've done a lot of interesting things on paint and partitioning into painted surfaces, but I should probably just leave that for another day. So with that, I'll end and appreciate any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Very interesting. Are there any questions? Thanks, nice talk. I think we can learn a lot about human behavior here. Um, I learned that at a gallery opening event, obviously everybody is drunk and didn't shower. So <laughs> no, I just have more an um, 
overarching question. And so your title of the talk is titled, uh, says indoor air quality. So in some ways we expect, okay, um, how good or bad is the air that we breathe indoors? So is this also something that you looked at? So what could be potential health impacts from various of these compounds that you have measured? I know you have focused a lot what comes from the people, but have you also looked at the other side of it? So you're, you're wondering about just what sort of reaction products and how, say, from ozone chemistry and whatnot, whether yeah, that so is problematic. Are any yeah. of the VOCs that you see around there um, actually, do they have any health impact on you? Would they be of I would say even the, the chlorinated products that we saw, for instance, which are ones you might think would be harmful. I, I think from looking into, there's not often a lot of toxicology data on things, which is usually the problem with these sorts of studies, right, in, trying, in terms of trying to figure out if something's harmful. But even for those, there's some information, and it's, it's, it, 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 the evidence isn't that they're, they're a problem. And for the other things, I don't think we would know much. I'm sure there's information on things like acetone and whatnot, but the, I don't, the concentrations don't get high enough to become a problem. Indoors, and some place like the, the art museum, for instance, it's so inc it's incredibly clean, with respect to everything. I mean, particle concentrations, ozone, and whatnot, which is important um, right, in terms of um, art conservation and things like that. Certainly. Are there more questions? Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, did I see on the uh, limonene, you had a harm yield of around 11% or so, was that? Yeah, well, that was yeah. an average of yeah. two values that had been from the literature, and then it fit our data OK, well. yeah, I was wondering how that compared with yes. yeah. that was derived or compared with literature values. Well, I was, uh, yeah, ours was a fit, right, to the curve. But it happens to fall right between the two literature values. For the yield, so from our mm -hmm. our fit, it's 11 percent, and the two values that have been measured are whatever five and 17. So okay. the average was 11. Yeah. <laughs> so fortuitous, I'm sure, but but nonetheless, it's of that order. Yeah. Part B of the same question, maybe. How much NOx NO is around there? So what's the RO2 lifetime, and how do you expect you know? Uh, These yields are obviously dependent on all of that, but yeah, I, I think uh, I'm trying to think. We we did look into that, and this has been published. I mean, the R the R two lifetimes were certainly sort of I think in the in the minutes range or more, right? I mean, there's just not much. There's very little NOx around, and so the sort of one of the things about this was that. In these very, it was interesting that in a, an environment like this, which is very clean, that you do see. Um, Chemistry similar to what people are seeing outdoors in terms of auto oxidation, that, that kind of stuff. And so you, you know, unless there is, I mean, you you can imagine right, you have ozone coming in from outdoors, right, which is going to titrate away NO. And so unless you have a pretty good source of NO coming in, you probably have conditions indoors that are really um, very sort of good ones for for an auto oxidation sorts of processes. There are more questions? I just have one, like, what's the next thing for this uh, project? Are there more, more um, research? So we're going to do some more things on, on campus, but we've also, the, as a result of the museum study, the, the program manager has been interested. Well, we've, we had a workshop a few weeks ago at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And so there's, there's the possibility that we're going to, there might be a large scale field study there. Um, and they have lots of interesting problems in, for art conservation. It's not, we tend to think of the problem as being just exposure to ambient air that, you know, that's come in from outdoors and that that's what damages art. But, but what they really struggle with is all the cases that they enclose the art in, which has really high, a lot of VOC emissions. And they, they see really interesting chemistry going on between their ob the art objects and the VOCs that are emitted either from things that they use to seal you know, edges where they've had, say, glass cases together, or other things that they might have to put in there. 
And um, it's, there's some pretty dramatic effects um, where they see sort of uh, deposits of things growing over periods of time, fairly short, and you can see all sorts of stuff basically accumulating all over this. And it's, it's a real challenge for them. So I'm, I'm hoping that we could, could actually get involved in something like that. I mean, the Metropolitan Museum is such a spectacular place. It would be a neat place to do a study. Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> Wait. Let's thank Paul again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.